Aloha and welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Lynette Cruz. I'm your host today, and it's been a while. I'm happy to be back, and I'm happy to have a really awesome guest. I keep saying that to him. I know I'm going to embarrass him. <laughs> My guest today is Dr. Ron Williams, Jr., who is going to actually share a little bit about himself. And our topic today is about archival work, um, new voices from the archive. So, Ron, happy to have you. Mahalo. Tell Mahalo. us about yourself and tell us how happy you are to uh, be sure. here. Sure, no, <laughs> I am. It's, you know, it's always a pleasure to come out here and share with the community and, and, and have you lead us. Um, my name is Ron Williams, uh, Ron Williams, Jr. Um, I originally came, I was born in Chicago, I'm Malahini to this place. I moved here in 1996. Um, came to Maui in 1996 and worked at Luau and, and was having a good life and, and got taken under the wing of a special kumu named Akoni Akana. And Akoni uh, started me on my path to, to, to being interested in Hawaiian studies and Hawaiian language. Um, I went to MCC, Maui Community College, uh, where, where Kiopi Raymond was my kumu. Uh, and then I went to um, UH Manoa to study under Dr. Trask, Hanani K. Trask, and Lily Kalakamate Lahiva and those folks. Um, I've just been really blessed uh, to have great kumu, to have folks that kind of carried me along uh, and gave me some of their ike. Um, I started teaching at Kamakaku about 10 years ago, uh, Hawaiian studies, different classes, um, and uh, got my BA in Hawaiian studies, my MA in Pacific Island studies, uh, and my PhD in Hawaiian history. Um, I was teaching up until last year when I've taken a new job uh, running a, a, a research institute for the university, uh, Lahui Hawaii Research Institute. Um, but my passion has always been with um, getting stories out to the community. Uh, so a lot of side projects that I do uh, involve that. So that's who I am. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to say that because that's the only <laughs> thing I can think of to say you know, when I'm talking with you. <laughs> well. <laughs> but when you were introducing yourself, it reminded me of something, a story, and I'm mm. not going to tell that story because it's it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird story. <coughs> okay. But you, you studied with Akoni yeah. Akana. Yeah. And I think I know a story about something that happened mm -hmm. with him, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to see it now, but okay. later. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then the other story I'm going to share is um, last year on September 2nd, mm. uh, Malama Makua has accesses uh, two times a month into Makua Valley. and. Last year on the Queen's birthday, we did an access. I, I think it was on a Monday. Yeah. Um, and Ron, you were mm. our guest. And yeah. it was just a really interesting day. We had a number of kupuna from yeah. Alulike join us. And they had music to share yeah. and hula. Yeah. And when it was your turn to talk, yeah. I think there was a lot of silence, dead silence, because of the information that you were sharing with them. Yeah. So before. Before we go any further, I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you got that information, mm -hmm. what that information was, mm -hmm. and what you thought the impact was mm -hmm. on the people who heard it. Sure. Yeah, sure, thank you. Yeah, that was a beautiful day. Uh, that was actually my first time I'd been out to Makua. Oh, great. Um, and so it was an honor for me to be there and, 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 and be with those kupuna. You know, before I get into what I spoke about it, just to let you know, there was a, there was a, was a kupuna there who w was in her 70s, I believe, and she brought her mother with her. Yes. Um, and I remember talking with her, and um, she said that her mother had, 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 had um, her, her, her mental capacities were slowing down and so forth, um, but that a few years ago she stopped speaking English and was only speaking Hawaiian. Yes. And I thought, wow, that, to me that was not only the, the, the awesomeness of, of her speaking Hawaiian again, but the idea that she was reverting to her inherent self, yeah, her native self, was really beautiful. Uh, that's one of the things that touched me about that day was, was, was hearing that story. But, um, but as a historian, what I brought out there was um, some new finds that we're finding in the archives, things like that. Um, I think people don't have an idea of, of the incredible treasures that lie within the archives in Hawaii um, and that are coming into the archives. You know, people tend to think of archives as these dusty old places filled with ancient books and kind of, you know, ephemera and things like that. Um, when there's things coming in all the time, you know, people, are, people pass and donate their things or, or somebody finds something in the attic or so forth and they come in. And sometimes they can be truly impactful and truly uh, monumental. And that's happened recently. Um, about a year ago, there was a uh, Baldwin descendant 
um, who used to come into the archives a lot. I, I work at the Hawaiian Historical Society as a board member there, but the Hawaiian Mission Houses is with us also in the same building. <coughs> and there was a, a woman who used to come in all the time, a wonderful Baldwin descendant, and she used to talk about the things that she had and so forth, and one day she would donate them. Um, and um, so towards the end of her life, she actually called Tom Woods uh, from the Hawaiian Mission Houses and had him come up to her house and evaluate the things. And it was one of the most tremendous um, collections of, of important material in Hawaii. Uh, they did donate the, the things, the family donated the things to the Hawaiian Mission Houses in February of this last year. Uh, and they've called it the W.O. Smith Collection, the William mm -hmm. Owen Smith Collection. Uh, William Owen Smith was the Attorney General for the provisional government and for the republic. He was one of the leaders of the overthrow. Um, but all the legal documents went through his hands, uh, and he kept a lot of them. So um, a lot of this stuff came into the archives. A and the, the fascinating, one of the fascinating parts about it is that it was held at this house in Manoa, in, in the, the woman's house in Manoa, in her backyard, <coughs> in a little Home Depot shed. <laughs> a big shed, I should say, because it was uh, fi about 57 boxes. Mm. Um, but, l but, you know, luckily everything was intact. Uh, and there's some, some of the most important national treasures of the Kingdom of Hawaii that exist. Wow. Um, thing, <coughs> you know, things that as a historian I, I knew by heart, I've read in a lot of books, but I never thought about, well, where's, the, where's that, that document, where's that original document? One of them um, I brought with us today that kind of uh, really struck me. I had a chance to go into the archive um, as they're processing it and, 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 and see some things, and one of them was this letter um, on January 17, 1893, um, when the provisional government takes over and this small oligarchy of white men declare themselves in charge, um, the Queen had a decision to make, and that was to fight or, or to, or to for protest. Now, we all know th that a lot of the stuff that's been studied and some of the stuff that's been talked about says that it's a good thing she didn't fight, because if she would have fight, she, she might have won that battle but would have lost the war more warships would have come, and then we'd have seen a transfer of sovereignty to the United States. Well, she didn't do that. She, she under international law, was brilliant. She filed a formal protest, and it's a beautiful protest, and, and I, you know, I mem had memorized it, you know, I, Lili Ukulani, by the <coughs> grace of God, Queen, do hereby protest, and so forth. Um, that original letter, the one she sat down at her desk and wrote, was in this collection. Um, so <coughs> we now have, in the, in the collection, this document, uh, that is the Queen's protest of January 17, 1893. And, and the reason why I think that's so important uh, is because I believe in, in the mana of that palapala, of that document. Um, it's one thing, you know, nowadays everybody does research online. It's one thing to go online and, and look something up and see it, or even to have a copy of it like this. To, to, to be able to hold <coughs> in your hands the document the Queen wrote, to see that, um, you know, changes lives. Um, Do you think... <laughs> Do you think the the descendants of mm. William O. Smith knew what was in that collection? Did no, they no, that's and that's my guess. The, the, I, I know the woman a little bit. Um, she and she actually passed during this process. Mm. Um, her granddaughter came out and is the one who really went through the entire collection and said, "Oh my gosh," you know, and and ended up donating it. Um, but but so <coughs> I don't think that they knew. Um, the woman who was holding the collection, her mother, had in 1938 asked the Bishop Trust. The Bishop Trust, not, not Bishop Estate, a uh, different one, but the, the Financial Bishop Trust had held all these documents. Uh, in 1938, she asked them for all of her father's stuff back. Um, they put it together and gave it to her uh, in 1938, and then it kind of went into storage. So once she passed, um, the, the daughter and the granddaughters and so forth, uh, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I don't believe they, they knew you know, quite what was in the collection. Um, but to see it come to light is just, is just amazing. We owe those descendants yeah. a lot yeah. for being willing to share that information yeah. with us. I totally agree. You know, and, and it's, it's an, sometimes in the world of libraries and archives and, the, and even with the publics involved, we tend to get, you know, we, we, we forget that um, not only the families, but the archives serve a purpose too. Um, Mission Houses Museum is a private archives. You know, they don't have to make this stuff public. Mm -hmm. um, but right away, Tom Woods <coughs> and the rest, of the, the rest of the board decided to not only make this public, but put it online. So they've been digitizing these documents and putting them up on the line for the, for the world to see. Uh, so so I, I mahalo them too. You know. They are fearless. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but yes. it's all good. In yeah. this climate, especially.
um, <laughs> so that was that was one thing was this was this letter of the Queen uh, that really struck me. Um, one of the other things I shared in Makua and, and I've been sharing elsewhere is a document that um, kind of changes a lot of history for us. As a historian, I've seen these battles erupt over Hawaiian history, uh, and oftentimes it's a he said, says, she said thing. It's it's this and know this and know this, and and there's and sometimes sometimes there's not the smoking gun out there. Sometimes we don't know for sure. Um, one of those incidents was when the overthrow happened, uh, January 17th, and Minister Stevens, the U.S. Minister to Hawaii, um, he declares the guy, the, the oligarchy, um, Dole, Thurston, those guys, he declares them the de facto government of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, the de facto government means they're the ones in charge physically. Um, de jure means they legally have the right, and he can't say that. But he can say, hey, I'm looking out at the scenery, and what I see is they're in charge. That's an important designation under international law. And he does that. He says, they're actually in charge. Minister Stevens says that. Well, when Blount came and investigated, he wrote that he didn't think that was true. He wrote that, I don't think they actually had control of a police station and, and so forth. You know, I think he, he said that too early. I, I think it was because he, he was part of the plot. So that came out in the Blount report. Um, when the Morgan report came out a year later, Senator Morgan really wanted to push annexation. So Morgan has a hearing and writes a report and says, no, 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 he, he, he did see that, and that's what he saw. So we have these two conflicting reports for 100 years. Um, now, a lot of the evidence supports the idea that Stevens, that they didn't have control. Stevens made a, an error and lied to Congress, mm -hmm. but, we don't, we, but we weren't sure. <coughs> so you have these battles, folks like the Grassroots Institute for Hawaii, and those folks come out and say, the Morgan Report says this, and, and we say, well, but the Blount Report says this. Well, in that collection that was just donated is a smoking gun. There's a letter um, from Minister Stevens, marked private, that is written on January 17, 1893, and the U.S. Minister to Hawaii writes to Senate to Dole and says, um, I recommend that we not make public my recognition of your government until we actually have control of the police station. <laughs> right? So he's telling them, you know, it's all this underhanded you know, stuff, and he's telling them, you know, I did that recognition, but we know it's illegal. So, so it's actually a, it's proof that Minister Stevens perjured himself in front of the U.S. Congress and that the Morgan Report was false. That's huge. Mm. Uh, regardless of whose side you're on, as a historian, that's, that's huge. Because now we, have, we know what happened in that period. And Stevens admits it himself. So, so seeing documents like this come, come back to the public uh, is so, in, so exciting. So exciting. Yeah. I think one other thing that, that um, I shared that day that kind of is a project that I've been working on that's really important to me um, is the 1895 Political Prisoners Project. Um, I'm working on a project with the Hawaiian Judiciary Center, uh, the King Kamehameha V Hawaiian Judiciary Center, um, looking at incorporating native voice and native stories into the history of the judiciary. Um, in doing that work, I, uh, they provided me a, f a catalog uh, that has photographs of some of the prisoners that were arrested for backing Wilcox and those folks to try to reinstate the queen. Um, the, 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 large, the larger story is that there is so much resistance. There are so many stories of Kanaka Oivi, men and women, who gave their money, who gave their jobs, who gave their lives even, fighting for their nation um, that, we, that we've forgotten, that we know nothing about. Um, we have a few stories. Um, the Royal Hawaiian Band quit their job. Mm -hmm. We've found out recently that policemen quit their jobs and firemen quit their jobs and so forth. We know that Robert Wilcox went to prison and a lot of men went to prison. But we're starting to be able to hear those voices in particular, um, the names, the photographs, um, and we can share those with the public, we can share those with families, and it changes lives. Um, there are about 40 or 50 photographs of their booking photographs of these men who had been arrested. The men who were directly involved in the Wilcox Rebellion were arrested for, for treason. But the provisional government, they say this in their own minutes, sent out people to arrest all, basically all the top royalist leaders and loyalist leaders, all the top Hawaiians, to kind of get information from them. And so men were arrested who were no part of it. And they went to prison. Uh, and we have their photographs now. I have this one uh, photograph of a man named Bob Ioka. Bob Ioka. And it's an example of one of the booking photographs from 1895. Um, one of the ones that, that touched me you know, I, I literally had trouble getting through the, the uh, pictures, was a man, a boy, named Kalua. 
Kaluma was 14 years old. So you have this photograph um, of a 14-year-old Kanaka Oivi boy who's in prison, in Oahu prison, the same prison where Navahi contracted tuberculosis and later died. It's a filthy, disease-ridden prison. And this 14-year-old Hawaiian boy is in there um, for supporting his queen and for supporting his nation. You know, that's a story that we all need to know. That's a story we all need to hear. And that's a story that boy has descendants today. So for me, when I brought these out, I, I meant to just throw them out there and, and, and see if, <laughs> you know, and tell the story. There were Kapuna at Makua who said, I know his family. I know his family, and so forth. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but beginning to get those photographs and these names out there um, means something to a nation. So I, I mahalo you for giving me that opportunity that day. That's actually way more than that. And we were having this discussion earlier in the day, and I'm going to talk a little bit, too, about... We have an organization, Kalei Mailele'i. Mm -hmm. We were a Hawaiian Civic Club. We are no longer a Hawaiian Civic Club. We have formed, reformed ourselves into a branch of the Hui Aloha Aina, mm -hmm. but we're continuing to do all the projects that we've done in the past, one of them is a drama called Kale Mali the Queen's Women. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a, a Kue sign display with names of people who signed the Kue petition in 1897. And our discussion earlier had to do with um, <coughs> why we do what we do. Um, there are all these people, there are all these, these names that have been forgotten for a century more and there's this idea that there's something going on at least for the last 10 or 15 years all of these names of people who no longer wish to be forgotten who who are kind of clamoring at the gates and want their descendants and others to know that they were important mm -hmm. um, and so when I look at the work that you're doing I, I don't look at them as accidents that all of a sudden these faces and these names pop up, and, but they sort of are uh, in line with an idea that we have not remembered where we came from. Uh, and I don't think it's our fault. Right. I mean, it was erased purposely, mm -hmm. but we're beginning to remember now. And names are gonna come and faces and histories and stories that are important for us to know who we are as a people who we are. Right. So when I, when I get a chance to witness you in action, such as mm -hmm. at Makua, and these, these pictures come up, I had not seen them either. And what I saw was a, a bunch of people who were absolutely speechless. They could not believe the history that you were bringing forth, but that you brought also photos mm -hmm. and names. And I know some of the people there went around and took with their <coughs> cell phones yeah, photos right. of every photo <laughs> and every name because it was information that had been hidden for some reason um, forever. Yeah. And so what is happening, I think, is through your research, thank you so much, mm -hmm. and through the archival resources that are somehow becoming available now, there is an opportunity for unification of the Lahui that is not exactly political, you know? Right, this right. is about history, mm. this is about owning your history, but also learning it as it comes online, you might say, yeah. because this is just the tip, right? right. Oh, it's the tip of a huge iceberg. There are thousands of stories out there like this, you know, and, that's, and thank you for, the, for, for mahaloing my work, but it's, I, 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 all, you know, I give all credit to them. And like you said, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not very religious, I'm not Christian, um, but I know what happens <laughs> and I know what I feel. Um, we talked a little bit about earlier about when I say voices from the archives, I, I'm being literal. <laughs> like, <coughs> I, you know, I struggled early on with what my kuleana was. Uh, I'm non-Hawaiian, I'm not even from here. Uh, so why am I telling these stories and, and why I'm am sure I doing this? I'm sure there's a lot this? of criticism about <laughs> that too. But for me, you know, th for me, th there were two reasons why I, why I followed this path. I didn't do it for money <laughs> and I didn't do, I never wanted to be a teacher. But number one, my kumu, uh, especially, specifically Dr. Hanani K. Trask and Lili Kalak Mate Lahiva, when they, when I got my bachelor's degree, I, I was done. And they said, no, you don't get to learn and walk away. 
you hear stories, we share an EK with you, it's your kuleana to go forward and tell them. And if you have a talent in this area, it's your kuleana to use that talent. So for me, that was one uh, reason why I knew I could move forward. The other one was the voices themselves. Um, you know, I, I've worked on a lot of projects where uh, a story came to me, uh, and sometimes in a literal voice. And yikes! <laughs> how, yeah. Well, and how dare you not do that? You know, like you could, I could worry about the politics, and I could worry about this, but you know, this, like this, the story of William White is a great example. Like, there's no way I couldn't do that story, um, and and to see the effect that it's had on people. Well, um, tell us about William White oh. because you haven't mentioned him oh, up to now. I'm surprised. <laughs> William has kind of been a project of mine for over a decade, and and. Um, it started with uh, my, my BA, my bachelor's degree. I was working in Lahaina with Akoni on the story of Lahaina. Um, Akoni always felt that the story of Lahaina was a lot older than when the missionaries arrived. Um, but so he, he trained myself and others to do cultural history tours of Lahaina. And we talked about Waine'e Church. It was the oldest church in Maui, uh, the Queen's Church, Queen Keopuolani's Church. And the church burned down. Um, following that story up and following up court cases and so forth, I came across these names of Hawaiians, and I was researching them, and I saw the name William White. And in my great stupidity, <laughs> I said, oh, that's a holy guy. <laughs> you know? So I just ignored him. Um, I've learned since then. But, um, but, but then it, came, it kept coming back around. William White, and William White, and William White. I'm like, who is this guy? I'm, okay, fine, I'll give him five minutes. And I started to study William White, and I realized, wow, his name is William Punohu White. He was a native Hawaiian lawyer, da, da, da. And the more I started to look into him, the more he started popping up everywhere. And so I started asking my kumu and my and professors and stuff like that about him, and nobody had heard of him. And I start, so, I, so I started going into his story, and then I was giving a talk one day with um, Craig Howes down at the uh, Judiciary Center on, on Joseph Navahi. And I was presenting on Joseph Navahi, and I finished up, and there was a kupuna in the back of the room, uh, it was kind of shorts on, a kind of a bus up t-shirt and gray hair. Ca casual. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, and, and he stood up and he said, you know, thank you so much for bringing out this story of, what Joseph, of Joseph Navahi. We need to know more about these heroes, including people like William White. And I was like, somebody knows William White? You know, who's that? So of course I went to talk to him afterwards, uh, and he was a kapun, uh, an ancestor of William White. He was a great grandson. Uh, his name was Talbot Peleiholani George, uh, an amazing man. Um, and so I got a uh, meeting with George, with Talbot, and he said, meet me next Saturday at Kalihi McDonald's. And so we started meeting on Saturdays, and he started, and I, and I was just, I didn't want to be Niele, so I just would go and listen, and he started sharing stuff about his great-grandfather. And the more I learned, the more I said, he was that, and he was, he knew the queen, and so forth. And I started to get more into his story. And it's just that type of thing where, you know, you, sometimes you, you have projects you're working on, you're not sure about where they're headed and whether you, but this, this, was, this was obvious. This, was, this is what, you go here next, you go here next. And it just kept happening like that. And so we started to put together the story of William White, and um, he told me some amazing stories about him. And at first I was a little, really? <laughs> um, and then I would do the research, I'd go into the archives, and I would like, here it is, he's right, that's, that's, the, that's what happened. And it turns out that William White was one of the most important Kanaka of that period. He was a good friend of the Queen's. He was a senator from Lahaina. He was one of the three men that helped write the Queen's Constitution in 1893 that she wanted to proclaim. When, on the morning of January 14th, when she's going to proclaim the new Constitution, the first thing she does that morning is she meets in the blue room of the palace with Joseph Navahi and William White, and she knights them, Knights Order of Kalakaua, the highest award in the kingdom, for their work on this new constitution. And she calls William White and Joseph Navahi two of the greatest patriots of the nation. Um, he was a member of Hale Nau'a. He was um, a member of Hui Kalai Aina. When Hui Aloha Aina, after Joseph Navahi dies, he was one of the five candidates to replace Navahi as the president of Hui Aloha Aina. He ends up being elected as the honorary president. There's two positions. Um, so he served in these positions of government, of, of this community. Uh, he leads a fight in Lahaina to oust the annexationist pastor from the church. Um, and a, and a brilliant man who was a, was a lawyer, was a, a legislator, was an orator, and who fought his entire life for his nation, and now no one knew him. And so, um, talking to Talbot uh, for, for quite a while, we used to meet at the Queen, Queen Emma Summer Palace also. Um, he told me one time, he said, finally, he said, Duran, is there something you want to know? 
is, is you have a question for me? And I said, well, I said, to be honest with you, I've been looking for five years for his grave. Um, I can't find his grave. His wife is buried at Kahumano Cemetery because she was a Kahumano Society lady. Um, but I can't find his grave. And I'm thinking maybe he went to the mainland and died there. Maybe, you know, I just, I don't know. I can't find his grave. And he looked at me and he said, I'll take you there next Saturday. Um, and I was kind of blown away. And, and, and uh, D. Texador, one of his friends and helpers and a niece of his, niece, yeah. came, to, came to pick me up. Uh, and we drove out toward, and I just, it was just quiet watching. And we drove up to Kahumano Cemetery and parked. And I was like, no, I've been here. I've looked around. He's not here. And we got out of the car and we walk over and we, where, the, where some of the whites are buried and his wife is there and he pointed to the ground next to his wife and he said, he's right there. And I'll, you know, and I'll tell you a, an honest um, thing that I'm ashamed of is, is I, as I doubted him, you know, I, I said, oh, uncle's got a story, you know, da, da, da. you know, he could, this man couldn't be buried there. Um, but I, I was going to do the research. So I went to the Queen Kahumano Society group and they have an original map of the cemetery. And he's buried right there in an unmarked grave. And that's when it hit me that um, all of this work, you know, like you talk about the erasure of a nation. Um, I don't think it's stretching to say this was the Thomas Jefferson, the, the you know, Ben Franklin of, of, of this kingdom. You know, there's men like that that are buried in unmarked graves. The Americanization of the islands in the 19-teens and 20s covered the landscape with Roosevelt High School, George Washington Middle School. We have a 40-foot bronze statue of President McKinley in downtown Oahu. The United States is 3,000 miles from here. Where are the heroes of the Hawaiian nation? Many times they're in unmarked graves. So that understanding, that, the weight of that hit me, and I, and I told Talbot, um, I'll do what I can to get him known. And one day we'll build a, a gravestone. We'll have him have a gravestone for him. Uh, so Talbot worked with me. We'd meet. We'd talk. We'd, I met other family members. I met about 30 or 40 family members. Um, Doug White that works over at HECO and his two sisters, Valerie Chun and Jean Gunther uh, from California. Uh, they flew down and met with me. And we shared the family. I shared everything about that I knew about William. And this whole project started about eight years ago. Now we've moved along. Um, so Last year, I finished up a, a story of William, uh, partially of William, but mostly of the, of the legislature, that was published in the Hawaiian Journal of History as the cover article last year. So that was, that was, that was great because it felt like, okay, now we've taken a step to get him down in writing. Um, and so Talbot enjoyed that. Um, Talbot, Talbot moved to the Philippines um, and would call me every once in a while. He had a wife and family there. Um, I was working mostly now with Doug White here, at, here in Honolulu. Um, and I didn't want to, to be honest with you, it, I, didn't, wasn't, I didn't feel it was my kuleana to push forward on the gravestone. It's the family's kuleana. So, so I we just was waiting. And then there was a weekend of events that happened that, that made it understood that it was supposed to happen now. Um, I got a call from Doug White, and he said, meet me tomorrow at, at Big City Diner. We need to move on this gravestone thing. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Um, literally, about an hour after his call, I was up working. I, I worked late at night. I'm a writer, and so it was about one or two in the morning, a, a few hours later. I went down to Foodland at Market City to get some food. I, was, I had to need some snacks. And there was hardly anybody in the store except for there was one uh, Japanese Hawaiian gentleman in front of me, <coughs> and he was having some poke. He had poke with Inamona. And I said, Hey, bro, where'd you get that poke? And he's like, Oh, I'm back there in the corner. Da, da, da. And he looked at me and he said, Hey, you're Ron Williams. <laughs> and I was like, yeah? And he said, hey, I've seen you on TV talking about my great-grandfather, William White. And I was like, wow, this is so, this is so cool. This is, we're you know, uniting the family. And he said, hold on, hold on. And he ran out to his truck and he brought me some fish. He said, I went fishing today. I want you to have this. You know, mahalo. And I said, oh, thank you, uncle. Thank you. And he left. And I thought, wow, that's two William White things in one day. Uh, two nights later, I got a call from my friend uh, Tanya Naehu out in Molokai. She was doing a project, a, a mural project for the students out there, where the top painters and artists from around the state would come and they'd help the students paint a mural. She called me and she said, Ron, there's somebody here who wants to talk to you. And I said, okay, who is it? And she hands this him the phone. It was the guy from Foodland, who's also an artist. He said, Ron, I had a dream last night. We're supposed to work on his gravestone. So now it's all coming together. <laughs> and I'm like, this is time to do this. <laughs> so I talked to Doug, we, 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 got, the, we got it together. 
Um, I felt strongly that this was a national project. Um, I've seen how these stories affect people when you let them be a part of them. And so I asked if, if the family if, if, if we could start a fundraising campaign to have a day of education for, about William White and to purchase a headstone to give him proper, a proper burial headstone. Uh, and they gave the go-ahead for that. Um, I had many people tell me it wouldn't work. I had never done a, I'm not tech literate. I had never done a GoFundMe. Um, I had a, a colleague of mine tell me, literally, he said, you'll never raise money like that for a history project. People don't care about history. You have to have somebody dying or a house having burned down. But I said, okay, well, it's worth a try, you know? So we wanted money to, to rent a hall, to have the education day, to purchase the headstone, and to have this formal ceremony. And so our budget was $7,000, which is a lot of money, especially in these times. Um, so about a month ago, we, I wrote a na little narrative, and I put a picture on it, and I put it up online about this history project. And in eight days, we raised over $8,000. And it was amazingly, um, it was a, an amazing thing to witness for me. Uh, it was humbling um, to watch the, the community, to watch Native Hawaiians come out and say, yes, we want a landscape that reminds us of our heroes. This man, William White, I know nothing about him, but I know he was an important Hawaiian. I want to hear about him. That's what people said. And they said it with their $5 and $10 and $100 and $300. Uh, and it was amazing to watch. I, had, I, I don't do GoFundMe, but I had <laughs> other friends tell me I've never seen one go, that, go like that. So um, it just goes back to me to this idea of the hunger of hist uh, for, for their own history that, that the community has. And the idea, you know, and, and yourself and I are, are messengers, I, th I feel like, you know. Um, I do work, but it's really, it's those voices. Mm -hmm. That was William White saying, saying, I want these events known about again. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So that's what I agree was. with you that we need to flip it over and try not to think that we can take credit for anything. Right. I mean, those messages are coming down constantly, but it's kind of like broadcast. Who's picking it up? <coughs> So right. messages may have gone to multiple people. Right. But if you're the only one listening, right. you're the one listening. And then you got the kuleana to do it. That's <laughs> right, because you heard it. It's yours. So. <clears throat> but it's, it's I think it's right. awesome. But I also think that yeah. it's uh, <coughs> layers of stories. Mm -hmm. Your story, which you just told, mm -hmm. and the story of every one of those descendants who mm -hmm. hooked up. And it's William White's story yeah. first. Right. Right? Right. So there are these layers, mm -hmm. what, what anthropologists would call thick <laughs> history. <laughs> yeah. Well, layers. It's, and yeah. it's true. There's a, there's a um, Doug, Doug White, um, knew a little bit about his great grandfather, but not much. He started bringing his daughter, who's a freshman at UH, um, to the meetings that we have. So you have William White's great great granddaughter now, knowing a lot more about him than anybody had in a long time. So, yeah. so that's William speaking to his great granddaughter, great great granddaughter. I'm looking yeah. at this as a kind of a, a model, mm -hmm. a yeah. template. Yeah. This happens to be about William White right, right now. Right. But as the, as the kupuna check in, mm -hmm. you never know. I mean, information is going to come, do this, do that. And I know it's not just for you. No. I think mm -hmm. everybody's, we all got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for ourselves as Kale Mailealii, we were paying attention. Yeah. But ours is, was uh, so broad that what we got was a lot of names. Mm -hmm. And yours is much narrower because yeah. you're doing individually, which is awesome. But, and I think others, if they pay attention, mm -hmm. are going to come to the same realization, which kind of leads me into this whole thing mm -hmm. about why research is important. Why is it important for you? Oh, it's, for me, it's so important because it's, 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 research is that link. You know, it, 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 it helps us take oral histories in families and stuff like that that are, that are vital, that are the foundation. It helps us take those and fill them in and connect places, connect stories. You know, uh, that's what, what's one of the things that motivates me is, is, is connecting to these research facts that I find. Um, you know, we, we were talking about the prisoners earlier. There's another story that, that's, that, that blows me away, the story of William Daniels. Another man who uh, I passed, who I thought was Haole, <laughs> and I look, and, and he was he was a Native Hawaiian uh, Haole um, judge in, in Wailuku. Uh, he was arrested in 1895. So I start 
you know, it's an inter interesting story. And so I start looking at his. And this is one of the 300 men that was arrested. Um, William H. Daniels um, was a, um, his family was the Cobb family also. Um, John Dominus Holt, his grandmother, was, was, a, was a relative. Uh, but William H. Daniels was a, was a judge in Wailuku who was a brilliant judge and loved by everyone, the foreign community, the native community. He was a part owner of Kaholave. He was, owned a taro factory. Really prop, I mean, a, a successful businessman, <coughs> well-regarded law, lawyer and judge. Um, he refused to sign an oath of allegiance to the, to the provisional government. And even though he refused, they kept him on for a while because, because he, was, he was that He was good. He was good, him. yeah. Um, but they finally started tightening down. And in, I think it was May of 1894, uh, they revoked his license to practice law. And they removed him from the bench because he wouldn't sign the oath. And we talk about sacrifices, and we talk about um, things you would do for your nation, things you would say for your nation. Uh, well, here's a man saying, I'm giving up my job, my career, and eventually you're going to see you know, everything he owned because he wouldn't sign a piece of paper mm -hmm. that said he was loyal to this new government. <coughs> um, the, so there's a petition started from, from natives and foreigners saying bring him back, but the republic doesn't listen. They refuse. Um, in 1895, he's picked up as a leader of, of as a loyalist leader, uh, and brought to prison in Oahu. From prison, uh, he writes a couple of letters to his wife. He's got ten kids, which he could support, being a judge and being and owning businesses and so forth. But going to prison, being blackballed from the judiciary and so forth, he loses his jobs, he loses his his resources, he loses his his properties, and so he's he's losing everything. Um, in prison, he writes his wife and says. How are you taking care of the kids? How are you feeding the kids? You know, he's terrified. He's let out. He's paroled or released. Um, he goes, takes his family and moves to Huelo on the east side of Maui to try to make a living out there. He can't even find a job there. He finally gets kind of a menial job on the water ditches that are being built in upcountry Maui. Um, and I'm starting, you know, I'm doing this research and I'm following along and I'm just going, wow, like as, even as a historian of Hawaiian history, the stories that I, the only stories I'd heard were, you know, the Royal Hawaiian Band quit their job. I started to hear stories about firemen losing their jobs and so forth. But I started to get this realization of the depth and the breadth of sacrifice that people made. Here's this man who, who's basically been reduced to, to, to trying to take care of his family. Um, and in April of 1897, he goes and picks up his paycheck from the water company, um, goes down and, and hands out his money to his friends in the field goes to his home in Huelo. Um, it's very descriptive, uh, excuse me, but he, he takes his, one, of his chill, one of his boys out of the main bedroom, um, closes the door, and he takes his own life. He kills himself. Um, and for me, that story really hit home, really hit me, because, you know, um, the covering over of, of history not only deflates a nation, it not only... Uh, kind of recasts people. But it hides stories like this, of this gentleman who was at the top of society, who was beloved by all, and who lost everything. Lost his job, lost his family, lo and, and lost his life um, for his devotion to his nation. Mm -hmm. um, now, not only is that a story that inspires myself as a non-Hawaiian, <clears throat> I can only imagine what that story means to the nation. I can not only imagine what that story means to his family. Um, so w we, I did a presentation on Maui at Iao Valley a couple of years ago, and I was going to speak at Iao Valley on, the, on these men. And um, so I, I found out he was buried at uh, Iao Valley Cemetery, Iao Community Cemetery, which is right off the road from, instead of going up the valley, you go down to the cemetery. And I believe it's a county cemetery. So it's the county of Maui's Kuleana to be taking care of it. And they're not. It's covered with eight foot tall peely grass and it's over covered and so forth. I searched through there for 20 minutes before I found his grave. Um, and again, you know, it's that uh, here's, a, here's a gentleman who gave his life for his nation. Uh, outside of that was already a prominent businessman, lawyer, judge. And his headstone is covered over by grass and, 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 and so forth. And he's not known. Um, that needs to be corrected. That's a um, heads up, too, for descendants of the Daniels family. Yes. I think I know. Yes, some. yes, yes. And that, I'm, I've just started to touch base yes. with them, but that's what we need to do, too, is, is all of that. And I think it's at some point they'll realize it's their, their kuleana because now they know mm -hmm. 
But man, do you not get the the idea that these, at least these two examples, are really um, a message coming through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. of us um, to and remember, yeah. to honor, to give them what is due, which is give them their name back, yeah. their histories, find them because they're around, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to happen. I think we're supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm in order to find ourselves, mm -hmm. to find them. Yeah. Because they'll tell us who we are, in case we forgot. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a kuleana. Yes. I don't and think we can run from it. And there's, you know, and, and, and you know, we focus on my work today, but there's, there's, there's lots of folks out here doing this work. Um, and there's literally, you know, we talked about a tip of an iceberg. With staff, <laughs> I can tell you a hundred of these stories. But I mean, there, there's there's thousands of these stories out there. Okay, we have the volunteer staff. <laughs> okay, nobody has any money. I know. <laughs> However, um, I know that there's a possibility of launching a kind of community mm -hmm. community-based research mm -hmm. effort mm -hmm. to have people go find find our history, right. um, find ourselves, and Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. I mean, we've, 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 the thing is, the information's there. Yeah. Um, you know what? We've got the list of 318 men that were arrested and went to prison. Um, let's, let's, let's take those names and, and, and find out who these men were and honor yeah. them. Let's own them. You know. I think they've been disowned, in right. a sense, just historically disowned because they became invisible. Yeah. But there's no reason they need to be stay that way and I, I don't think they like it. No. Which is why, <laughs> That's know, why they, they speak. <laughs> whacking people on the head, go here, go there, do this, do that. I'm a believer in ancestral yeah. call. Oh, yeah. I am. And I think that if we all admitted to it, we would also mm. say that you're having dreams, somebody's calling, um, mm. telling you go here, look at this, read that, meet this person or whatever. To run into a descendant yeah. <laughs> in the market <laughs> in the middle, you know, two o'clock in the morning or whatever is like, that's crazy. That's being led. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's so voices. Don't go at three, don't go at <laughs> one, go at two. Right. And right. so then you, can, you cross paths and I, I think it's, it's really good. Well, but and also I was just thinking, there, you know, there's also, you know, I focus on men, there's, there's women's stories that are, that are a little more difficult to get to sometimes because the record wasn't, you know, kept as much, um, but are obviously just as vital and just as important, and they're out there. You know, there's, um, you know, the, the women, well, while these men were in prison, the women wrote petitions to get them released. Mrs. Abigail Kuaileni Campbell led a group to go to the prison and protest and say, we want our men to come home. Um, you know, there's women, uh, there's, there's a project I've been working on about uh, women in politics right around the time of the overthrow and afterwards and so forth. And it's a really interesting project because the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, women were nowhere near. They, they weren't involved. Um, they didn't go to, this, you know, give speeches and so forth. The Hawaiian Home Rule Party was, was not only were women involved, they were part of the directors. They were giving stump speeches. They were leading rallies. Uh, and so those women's names we have. And so starting to, to, to recognize those women, again, mm. is, a, is an important <coughs> thing. You know, when I mentioned Mrs. Campbell, I can sh if I have something I can show you real quick um, that struck me. When I went to Oahu Cemetery recently, um, you know, th these things, th these things, you know, all of these acts, all of these actions, all of these speeches, um, you can't read them without being moved and understand um, how much love they had for their nation, you know, um, the sacrifices. But not only the sacrifices, the honorings. Mrs. Abigail Kuaihalani Campbell, who was president of Huila Ha'aina for Women, um, the queen was dethroned on January 17, 1893. In April, I believe, of that year, a few months later, Mrs. Campbell had a child. Uh, she was pregnant when the overthrow happened. Um, I had heard rumors and I heard, heard stories that she named her child something important and interesting, and, I, and it's true. I went to the cemetery the other day and I found it. She named her child Royalist. So um, her child was named Royalist Campbell. Um, so think about that. You know, in the midst of this overthrow, in the midst of this um, danger of the nation being given away, she bestowed the name Royalist on her child. <coughs> um, and that child, the child didn't live long, lived to be three years old, and her, she's buried there with her mom. Um, but, but actually, you know, 
what kind of stories, what kind of, of, of things is that child carrying? You know? I'm going to tell you a story. I forgot about yeah. it. Um, and hopefully it will be well received by the <laughs> person who, who is. Anyway, there was a gathering at the Kana'ina building. I don't know how many years ago, 15, maybe longer, 20. And <clears throat> Yolani Palace was engaged in doing these public meetings to talk about whether or not they could, should close the gates at 11 o'clock mm -hmm. at night, okay. front and back. Mm -hmm. um, and people were really not favoring it because people wanted to just be there whenever they want to be there. Mm -hmm. So these meetings were being held and um, Mrs. Campbell's great-granddaughter, okay. one of them, mm -hmm. not going to mention a name, she, she came to that meeting. I think she was presiding at that meeting, and she said, she said this, I'm sorry I'm late, <clears throat> but I had a dream last night that I needed to go to the cemetery um, and to gather the flowers. I, I had to go to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So she said, so early in the morning, she went to the flower shop mm -hmm. and bought all of these flowers. Um, and took them to the cemetery and laid them there. Mm. And she said, but I, I didn't want to just leave them there. And I wasn't sure what it meant that I should be gathering the flowers. But anyway, that's what I did, and that's why I'm late. And everybody just <laughs> sat there with their mouths open because we understood the significance of that. Yeah. It was us, yes. you know? <laughs> and so that's a, a story. It really happened. Yeah. A lot of people were there at the, at the time, and yeah. I don't think to this day she understood what she said. Right, right. But well, and, and that's some, sometimes, sometimes the messenger doesn't, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's just that. But it was Kuliana, right? Right. And it came, right. and then the rest of us got it, and it was, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah. But how's that for a cool start? I know, yeah. That's, uh, it, and it happens <clears throat> again and again and again. I, and you had mentioned the term, not just royalist, mm -hmm. but loyalist uh, earlier, and I wanted to ask you what the difference was. Yeah, it's, it's a very important distinction. You know, one of the things about, you know, Dr. John Osorio wrote an article a few years back uh, that was a following up of John Dominus Holt's article on, on being Hawaiian. And Dr. John Osorio said, um, you know, that one of the problems, he's speaking about Hawaiians, he's saying one of the problems for us is that we don't know who we are because we've lost that history. You know, so, so sometimes we, we, we'll learn a term or, or, or something and, and we'll kind of just use it in a general sense. Um, but w the more we learn ab about the history, the more we start to see, oh, where the, where the places fit. Um, I've always used the term royalist to, to describe the Hawaiians that fought for the kingdom. You know, they were royalists. Uh, and many of them were. But there's a, real sp but there's a specific difference w when they were using the term. Um, there were folks, you know, Hui Aloha Aina and Hui Kalai Aina, the two groups, um, both did petitions. Uh, um, one of the petitions focused more on non-annexation, and one of the other petitions focused more on non-annexation and returning the queen to the throne. Um, royalists were those that, that were devoted to the monarchy, you know, the queen, and Kalakaua before it and so forth. So royalists, when we say royalists, we mean folks that were devoted to the monarchy. Um, a loyalist were folks who were devoted m maybe to the royalty, but also to the nation most, most of all. Um, a good example is Robert Wilcox. Um, Robert Wilcox, uh, you know, and family members have, of his have even shared with me that, that they were told, you know, we're loyalists. Because Robert Wilcox wasn't always about, sometimes he, he you know, sometimes he seemed to uh, not be crazy about the queen or so forth. Um, but, he, but, he, but he would never have have let the nation go, right? So there were folks who fought, fought um, to keep the nation independent and under Kanaka control, and they were loyalists. Um, famously, Joseph Navahi, one of our greatest, one of the greatest patriots, Joseph Navahi and William White, were part of a, 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 a political party during Kalakaua's reign that was calling Kalakaua out on stuff he was doing. You know, they said, hey, don't go get a million dollar loan from a foreign country, it's gonna put us in debt. You know, and so they, they kind of critiqued and criticized Kalakaua for certain things he was doing. So they were, so they were loyalists, yeah? And they weren't royalists, mm -hmm. they were loyalists. Now, when the threat came to take the nation, they backed Kalakaua and every, you know, because they're, because they're loyalists. It's, the nation was the most important thing. Um, 
So, so folks could be royalist and loyalist, but those folks who, who claim themselves as loyalists were usually those that were thinking of the nation number one. Yeah. That's a good distinction to make because yeah. it kind of gets us to think about who we are. Mm. Who are we today? Uh, are we devoted to a person? Mm -hmm. Are we devoted to the country? Mm -hmm. um, and how should we express those, those concepts of royalists and loyalists? Yeah. So cool. Yeah. I feel like... <coughs> We have covered like a semester's worth of work yeah. in a really you know, <laughs> short pieces. Yeah. What do you see for the future? Uh, I see, you know, I, 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 I kind of sometimes have to rein in my excitement <laughs> because, because I think there's so much, I, I, I see the future as being so incredibly bright as far as uncovering these voices, telling these stories, and that has an effect. It, it's beyond my control or your control. When the Kupuna's voices start to be heard, and they start to move their descendants. That's going to cause stuff to happen. I don't know what. I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not going to. You know. I, I don't. I, I have things that I think about and so forth like that. But but you know, um, the the vision of what Hawaii looks like in the future. I, I don't know. But I believe strongly that it's going to be affected by the kupuna in in much greater ways than it has in the past. Because you can't. You can't platform those voices without making that change. So, you know, many of us, not all of us, but many of us uh, have been wrapped up lately in what's going on in the U.S. presidential election and, and those types of things. Um, what I know is that my life, my day-to-day -day life, is spent um, being blessed by having kupuna tell me th about this story or, or, or tell me about how this story that I brought to them meant something to them in this way. There's no greater joy, right? And, and so for me, I see the future as, as, as folks being able to share these stories, others doing, you know, there's many others doing this work now, but, but our legions being joined. Mm. Um, and that's, that's a day-to-day -day positive thing that, 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 that changes the big picture too. So I, th I think it's good. Let's talk a little bit about Facebook. Yeah. And the reason oh, yeah. I, I bring that up is yeah. because information sharing mm -hmm. is really outstanding. Mm -hmm. The kinds of responses that I, oh, yeah. I see, and I, they're not even, you know, like, it's not me. I'm just reading what's right. up there. What's the impact? You know, it, I'm, I'm, I've been accused of being a Luddite. <laughs> In my office, they're like, Ron, you're not a tech person. And I, eh. and I'm, I, I try, and I, you know, I do the best I can. But I'm blatantly aware of the power of it. Um, you know, I, on my own personal Facebook page, but also I, I do the Facebook page for the Hawaiian Historical Society. Um, and I've seen that explode. Um, there's a desire, there's a hunger, there's an ono out there for the stories. Um, because again, we're not talking about the French Revolution, or we're not talking about the Russian czars. We're talking about what happened here. And the people here are affected by that. And when you put something out, you know, what the typical path in academia is to take a, pick a topic and research it for a couple of years or more and then spend a couple of years writing it up and then put it out for publication and then get rejected and da 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 and then da da and then five or six years down the line you turn it into a book and, and so your project will come to a book in about eight or ten years. That's all changing because you know for myself I, I do academic work but I also do work, I think, in the community. And, and the, way I, the way I do that is to take this research. If I'm out at the State Archives and I'm photographing 500 documents, when I go home that night, I can pick a couple and say, wow, check out these things. And I can put it up on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And like you see, said, <coughs> you know, if it's about, you know, Tom Jones, you know, there'll be three or four people that are like, that's my grandfather. Yes. You know? And so it's, it's amazing uh, and, 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 and a great way to it share. Is. And I'm, I'm always really happy to see it because not only are you writing a little bit of a summary, mm. but you're also posting the document, mm. which is another way of saying, okay, don't take my word for it. Right. Go look. Mm. And if you want more information, go down and do the research. But I'm also beginning to see people connecting every time you post a name. Yeah. And, so and somebody is saying, that's my family yeah. or, or something. They know who these, these people are. And what that tells me is that they have just been introduced themselves to their own history. Right. And you know, then it, it, the kuleana falls on them to go do something. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm, and 
Could we have done this 10 years ago? I don't think so. Uh, I, don't I don't think, think so. so. You know, I spoke with, um, <clears throat> I, I did an interview for, uh, that I wrote for a magazine with, uh, with Ed Grevy mm -hmm. uh, last year. And I spoke with him. And, and he, you know, he told me about the days when he and, um, who's the gentleman who started Save Our Surf? Uh, um, John? Yes. Yeah. What's John Kelly? John Kelly. He said, oh, we used to go in to, the, to his house at night and have dinner, and we'd, and we'd do up these flyers, and, da -da -da, and we'd yes. put up 500 flyers, and, da -da, and we'd bring the flyers around. And, I, and he said, and now, he said, when I go out to photograph an event, and I go home to, f to develop my photographs, by the time I develop those, there's a thousand photographs already online. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he when was I'm on the side, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sending stuff out immediately. Yeah. We're here, come on down, or right. whatever. Right. And, and, and he was, he was a little wistful about that, but he also yeah. said, I, he said, I'm so glad. He said the Mauna Kea thing never could have happened right. without social media. Ron, thanks so yeah. much for being with me today. And Thank I'm you. always trying to Thank you. keep to my time. And obviously, yeah. we should do this more often. Thank you so much. But it's really good to have you and yeah. to listen to what you have to share. And yeah, we're all information junkies yeah. right underneath it all. Yeah. Um, and thank you guys, too, for watching. I'm Lynette Cruz. This is Issues That Matter. My guess is Dr. Ron <laughs> Williams, <laughs> Jr. <British> Ron. <laughs> and we've been talking about history yeah. and our own history and letting those voices come through. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much.